right. So welcome everybody. Um, we're very lucky this evening to have um, previous prize winners of the Hippocrat of Hippocrates Prizes uh, from various years, and they've agreed to read in alphabetical order of surname, which means that Claudia, Claudia Daventry, will go first. In the middle will be Alex, Alex Giuseffi, and bringing up the rear will be Chris Woods. Um, all of them have agreed to go into the rattle bag of history and dig out a yummy poem that they admire, and they will explain why they like the poem so much or why it is very good for us all to be acquainted with. And um, as I think you'll all remember from previous events like this, the only important thing about these is that they should be out of copyright. Um, and all of the poems that we're hearing of that kind tonight are out of copyright. That's just so we don't have to do lots of tedious negotiations of permissions with the publishers. And the, the three poets will also read from their own work as well. So they'll all be going for about 15 minutes each, which if we add on a few minutes of conversation with them about their work per poet, then I think that makes it a good hour and we can have as much conversation as we want. Um, so Claudia, um, you'll remember her MRI scanner poem, which took the first prize a year or so ago. Uh, she is going to, well, I, in fact, I'm not going to tell you who she's reading from, but her dead poet is, I think, a, a sure hit. And I, without more ado, I shall hand over to Claudia. Claudia Daventry, please welcome her, everybody, and then mute yourselves. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, so I have chosen to read John Donne um, because he is definitely so one of my favourites and um, so intriguing and um, clever and musical. And I find him endlessly fascinating because every time I go back and look at John Donne, if I'm ever just stuck, I go back and read John Donne, I'm always inspired to do something. Um, and so this poem, The Relic, um, I'm going to read The Relic and then um, a couple of my own, which um, I was surprised and not surprised to find these two poems in, in my uh, chat book here are a sort of, between them, a kind of combination which make up something very similar to The Relic in a way. The, the theme, anyway, is, is similar. So, The Relic. When my grave is broke up again, some second guest to entertain. For graves have learned that woman had to be two more than one a bed. And he that digs it spies a bracelet of bright hair about the bone. Will he not let us alone and think that there a loving couple lies who thought that this device might be some way to make their souls at last busy day at the last busy day meet at this grave and make a little stay if this fall in a time or land where misdevotion doth command then he that digs us up will bring us to the bishop and the king to make us relics then thou shalt be a mary magdalene and i a something else thereby all women shall adore us and some men and since at such time miracles are sought, I would have that age by this paper taught what miracles we harmless lovers wrought. First, we loved well and faithfully, yet knew not what we loved nor why. Difference of sex no more we knew than our guardian angels do. Coming and going, we perchance might kiss, but not between those meals, our hands ne'er touch the seals which nature, endured by late law, sets free. These miracles we did, but now, alas, all measure and all language I should pass, should I tell what a miracle she was. Can you tell us why, why you chose that one in particular? There's such wealth in Don John Donne. Absolutely, yes, I could have chosen the flea, and I was close to that, but... Um, 
I think particularly and specifically because um, I'm doing a set of three poems here, which um, the other two, you'll see when, when I read the other two, that there's something of a theme that, uh, that goes on about life being intrinsically linked or death being intrinsically linked to life and life to death. And it sounds a bit like T.S. Eliot. But um, I just think that there's something so beautiful about that bracelet of bright hair that um, jumps out of the poem and it comes down the centuries to us. You know, we dig it up in the poem, we dig it up as we read the poem and there it is, the bright bracelet. It's a formidable conjuring trick, I think, to have that. And, and just, to, just to look at how he does that, it's, I think the choice of the word bright is miraculous because he could have said anything more specific, golden, copper, I don't know, auburn hair, but just not to be specific and just to give us bright, it's, it's almost angelic. And he says she's Mary Magdalene. I mean, you often see those depictions, don't you? Those sort of um, beautiful Renaissance, uh, that, that Venetian blonde hair that Mary Magdalene often has. Um, I see it as a, he, he, he speaks, there's another poem where he has a, um, a hair bracelet around his arm and I think this is something that um, he actually did have. But I love the way that it becomes more than just, uh, more than just, a, it, it, it sort of rises above the poem and it jumps out on its own. And I think it's very interesting. It's, it's hard from um, hearing a reading and I don't know how it feels to hear it read. I don't know when I last heard this poem read by somebody else, but it's a very um, intricate poem as John Donne always does that sort of um, strip the willow of weaving in and out of uh, conceits uh, and lines. And this idea of um, who is this woman? It, it I mean, seems that they're young, that, um, that their love is quite chaste and yet somehow extremely profound and that their bones, that they, it transcends these bones that they, they're, they're brought as relics to the bishop and the king. And his, uh, I think his Catholicism comes into it as well, which he calls misdevotion. Um, but that's also a play on, you know, the misdevotion of love. Um, All women shall adore us and some men, and since at such time miracles are sought, I would have that age by this paper taught what miracles we harmless lovers wrought. I think that's, again, that's the bright bracelet. It's about that sort of purity of love and there's nothing more complicated than that in spite of it first we loved well and faithfully yet knew not what we love nor why difference of sex no more we knew than our guardian angels do coming and going we perchance might kiss but not between those meals it's a very um, innocent mm. well i don't think it is innocent in in many ways but it's it's knowing innocence there's a it's it's transcendent and I think it's just a very beautiful poem. And the, its ending line, or measure and or language I should pass, should I tell what a miracle she was, is the most beautifully soaring line to end on. I just think every time I read this, I come back and think this is how to write a poem. That's what John Donne does for me. And, and this poem and many others. I'm going to pass on to um, the two poems I'm going to read you out of my little chapbook here which is called the oligarch loses his patience the rather fine picture on the front i'm always very fond of that guy apparently he was an absolute tyrant he had about a hundred children um so the first the first poem i'm going to read you is called long barrow and it is about again being dug up long barrow Beauty's on the inside, so they say, but they don't know who can judge my clutch of soft and pulsing organs that pump, flux, stop, reflux, gouts of astonished blood in cyan and magenta round the scaffold of my bones, my meat, and my dark caverns. Who's to say these creamy glands, two butter beans in sanguine sauce, these deviled kidneys dark as plums, my lover's liver, glistening like a deep sea conch, this duodenum crinkled damp and pocketed as purple rack, or the twin sea slugs of my lungs that plunder air, a lovelier or more temperate than another girl's. Skin deep's more legible, so now 
let me enhance the parts that underneath this skin are less than taught, and translate nature's failings with synthetic sympathy, building a shrine in silicon to my elastic youth. When they stumble on my long barrow and dig me up, they'll find my parchment in a randomness of sticks, my bowl of skull fissured with fine occiput craculure, two black stair holes, my gap tooth grin. Tangled in the nuggets of my vertebrae, mum's locket, and on the birdcage of my ribs, will sit two jellyfish, pristine, intact, pert as the day they were slipped in. So much for cosmetic surgery. The next poem, it is about a couple and a tomb. Homing. Here's to the two who coupled could grace the marble hollows of a double tomb, yet they rise and part at the selva oscura. One stands on the spit looking out to sea, staggers in a spray, drenched by the surge and swell, a heave and massive chuck of the wave over the shoulders and head, the keen blade of onshore wind that grazes throats and wrists. The other has no fat, is spare, burns down wood to the last embers, no char, no ash blowing in an empty grate, wades through cold beneath a parting curlew, must rake the sand to upturn a shell. Both say to the spit roast or to the lares, no, no to wall to wall, no to knowing the warmth in the bed beside them is daily bread, no as intimacy's sweetness turns to chalk, yes to the chance meeting, sweet nick of a scalpel, to a shriek on a higher frequency, to sift a nugget of truth from the white noise of talk, of giving it all up for a single shaft of flint, cool in the palm, for the upturned bottle and a slur of eau de vie, for a stab of pain at the musk of new sweat, and who come back again and again to the unwritten contract, unringed or like wild birds, migrating across continents, who return to the crumbling ledge, who cover miles but mate for life, who, giving into the force that drags them home, windswept, road-weary, soar with the royal of salt, test the raw edge of what might even be love. Time. Michael, would you like me to uh, go on? One more. Yes, please. Armistice. In times of war, remember how behind the disused armaments hangar there is buddlier, where butterflies tangle and scatter dew. That as mortars release their soft crump and thud from miles away, houses fold in on their hearths. Paper games of marriage beds are crushed by falling masonry. Remember the two planes that spun out and landed in fields separated by razor wire. As the dust floats down, remember to seek out the black box of who I meant to be. Thank you. What extraordinary poems. There, there is such a fierce and intense marriage of the immediate and visceral and sensuous in the poems with, um, with this. In fact, this is why Dunn means so much to you, I suppose, because it's, it's married to something which is insistent about its metaphysics, isn't it? I absolutely think so, yes. And it's funny, it's unconscious. I've never consciously tried to uh, sort of mm. copy, replicate or, or write a done at all. Um, but I think that's why you're right. That's why he speaks to me so much. It's something about the, that inherent sort of iconography in those, those sort of symbols and um, those visceral things. The first poem was so full of extraordinary colors and imagery of of organs and insides and so on that I felt I was looking at an anatomy painting of the old times. Yeah, like the Dr. Tulp. I, was very, I used to live in Amsterdam and I was very fond of uh, Dr. Tulp. It was one of the ones I kept going back to look at. It's so macabre and beautiful. And then you had that, you have these contradictions within themselves as John Dunn does as well, like the white noise of talk. What a great expression, so simple and, and such a lovely paradox, such, such an active and, and um, buttonholing paradox. 
I thought it was very good reading, Claudia. Uh, thank you very much. Do, I, are you interested in archaeology and digs and things? Um, I've written some about bog people as well, and I think it's more about I'm really interested in death and um, then digs come into that yeah. you know, obviously it, it's less i know nothing about my technical knowledge of digs is is zero so it's more about that mm. kind of it, fascinating like those bog people of their hair and then john dunn talks about that hair around the bone i think that's a beautiful there's something so there's life in death which is, is so interesting and i love as well those day of the dead mexican skulls that have you know, palm trees growing out of the, 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 the top and, and spiders falling out of the eye sockets. I just, I guess I'm just pretty macabre. Maybe I'm Catholic deep down, maybe in my other life. <laughs> I thought the idea of what might be in your own barrow is such a sort of fruitful idea, really. It sprang <laughs> out of, I was joking with <laughs> another poet about exactly that sort of awful idea I think of I, I don't know I, I find cosmetic surgery a very difficult idea the idea that people would mm. you know increasingly young women or, or lots of people all sorts of people are doing it men women um, you know to cut your body open and put stuff in there to make yourself look better and the idea that that doesn't decompose but that your body would decompose around it and it would be left is so I think it's a great joke <laughs> It's really funny, the idea that you'd be dug up. I know it's, it is utterly macabre, but I think the macabre is wonderful, very funny. And it's a startling image, isn't it? The jelly, yeah. the two jelly yeah. that exactly. were in there on the rib cage. Exactly. Do, do, do you think uh, Seamus Heaney showed the way with this, with his with his bog poems about, um, you know, that, I mean, that when I when I read those, I mean, they, they were endlessly fascinating yeah they're great aren't they and i went to see those bog people in um, really? dublin yes they are i'm a, i'm amazed you can write poems about those bog people because <laughs> they fun. are really um it, it's very moving and and a little bit intrusive i think to see those people they're people right. um and um he talks about that though doesn't he yes he does yes, he's, he's, got, he's very poems. good at looking things in the face isn't he he yeah. and she she outstares his gaze doesn't she yes she I think that's exactly the feeling yeah. that you get yeah. yeah I mean I think I think death is um it's 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 an enormous it has enormous potential for uh life for talking in life it's it's got so much leaving Heaney out of it for the moment it, this connects very much with with Dunn again of course and um Eliot has that line, doesn't he? I mean, Dunn, I suppose, was such another who found no substitute for sense. It's this, this poem he has about Dunn and Webster mm -hmm. and how these uh, breastless creatures underground lean backwards with a lipless grin. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's uh, very much about the bone. And I also wonder myself often whether, whether um, Kathleen Rain took her adjective bright in that famous uh, image uh, he has married me with a ring of bright water. Whether that, because that bright adjective, which as you said, Claudia, is not the one you expect, but it's absolutely phenomenal, um, that sticks in the mind. And I think that Kathleen Rain took her adjective from, from Dunn myself. It might have done. Mm. I, know, I mean, I know that it, it, it is true that it bright jumps out. And I, I remember it from Othello, you know, that the first line of Othello isn't it? Keep up your bright swords or the dew will rust them. And that is, again, it does the same thing. It's that, that word is an extraordinary, uh, the bright swords suddenly just shine out of the, um, mm. the, 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 mm. the play before it's even started. So I, I think you're right. I mean, maybe it came from Dunn, maybe from Shakespeare, maybe, who knows, maybe it's just a magic word. But if we put it in a poem just for the sake of it, it you can bet your bottom dollar it wouldn't work. So it's got to be in the right place, hasn't it? By the, the, right thing, the great thing about it is that it's understated because yes. the, more, the more extravagantly people try with their adjectives, the less effective they become. Yes. <clears throat> yes. Claudia, I have a poem think... called Bright, actually, and it's, um, it's not about being bright at all. It's interesting. But there we are. That's <laughs> just an aside. It's a joke poem. I'll send it to you one day. <laughs> that sounds good. I think we may, we may all come around to asking for a, an encore from each of you at the end. And so save it up. But I think it'd be nice now. Thank you so much, Claudia. Um, if we moved on to our second reader, Alex. 
Alex Giuseffi, who was a prize winner uh, way back in our very first competition. Mm -hmm. But Alex, in all seriousness, you've always, you've consistently been a marvelous poet and we'd love to hear from you now, please. Thank you so much, Michael and Donald too, for the chance to be reading here this evening. This is brilliant, as it always is with Hippocrates. That's why I have even followed the Hippocrates crowd to Venice on one occasion. Yeah. To keep, keep in touch. Um, so I've, the poem I've chosen is by Charlotte Mew, and it's The Trees Are Down. Um, I partly chose this because I because I had to find something out of um, copyright by, as, as um, Michael has kindly put it, a dead poet. Um, I, I thought I really want to find a woman if possible, because the temptation is to go for my favourite poets and just because there are more of them, I would tend to find people like Dunn more readily. So I, I sort of searched and found this poem by Charlotte Mew who I think is, I'm sure people know her and know of her, but she's possibly not as well known as some. Um, she's a lovely poet, not particularly prolific in poetry, um, sort of writing across the turn of the 19th to 20th centuries, so contemporary with people like Hardy and the First World War poets too, actually, um, and had a very tragic life but I find terrific energy and joy actually in this very elegiac poem. And it's interesting to me because it's also, you could say it's a, a kind of eco poem. It's about what are we doing to the natural world and what should we think about that, at least on one level. Um, it's also, I love the energy and vigor in this poem. Although it's elegiac, it's full of life actually and full of, beautiful language, rhythm, um, sort of the, the, the very long lines almost seem a little bit American to me, perhaps, in this poem. And, and her use of enjambement, which um, I think was something she developed interestingly in her poem, also gives it a terrific um, feeling of energy. And you'll see how that works in the poem. So the trees are down. And there's an epigram, epigraph. He, he, and he cried with a loud voice, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, from the book of Revelation. They are cutting down the great plane trees at the end of the gardens. For days, there has been the great of the saw the swish of the branches as they fall, the crash of the trunks, the rustle of trodden leaves, with the whoops and the whirls, the loud common talk, the loud common laughs of the men above it all. I remember one evening of a long past spring, turning in at a gate, getting out of a cart and finding a large dead rat in the mud of the drive. I remember thinking, alive or dead, a rat was a godforsaken thing, but at least in May, that even a rat should be alive. The week's work here is as good as done. There is just one bough on the roped bowl in the fine gray rain, green and high and lonely against the sky, down now. And but for that, if the old dead rat did once for a moment unmake the spring, I might never have thought of him again. It is not for a moment the spring is unmade today. These were great trees. It was in them from root to stem, with the men with the whoops and the woes have carted the whole of the whispering loveliness away. Half the spring for me will have gone with them. It is going now, and my heart has been struck with the hearts of the plains. Half my life it has beat with these in the sun, in the rains, in the March wind, the May breeze, in the great gales that came over to them across the roofs of the great seas. There was only a quiet rain when they were dying. 
they must have heard the sparrows flying and the small creeping creatures in the earth where they were lying. But I, all day, I heard an angel crying, hurt not the trees. I think I love the kind of tidal feeling in this poem that it moves from introducing this, this shocking scenario with the grate of the saw and the fact that right at the end of the garden, so close, this huge destruction is happening and the, and the shouts of the men and so on. And then it goes quite contemplative and she thinks about life and death via the, the story of the rat. Um, and then about the enormity of the death of, of a tree, of, of a grove of trees actually, in this case. What, what a big thing it is. It's not for a moment the spring is unmade. These were great trees. It was in them from root to stem. And the whisp I love her sort of adoration of the trees really with the whispering loveliness and half of the spring that they've taken down with them. Um, yeah, it's beautiful. And then at the end, she writes of the great gales that have swept across uh, that lovely phrase that the great gales that came over to them across the roofs of the great seas. And it's suddenly got this image of these sort of huge undulating roofs of the seas with the, the wind blowing over and over across the trees. And then it settles down to the quiet rain, the sparrows, the small creeping, creeping creatures as the, the trees are down. Um, so I just, I, I love the musicality of this poem. Um, and the, the, it's, it's a sort of surge of emotions to me, I think. So I thought, do you want to say something, Michael? Are you? I, I just wanted to mention to you, Alex, since you won't have been seeing the chat because you can't when you're reading and talking. No. Um, Louise mentioned that she had recently visited Charlotte Mew's grave in Hampstead Cemetery. Oh, wow. Right. And, and Kevin wrote that he was reminded, uh, this will remind you of our emails, mm. of Manly Hopkins's Binsey Poplars. Yes. Um, so I, I suspect we can come back to this whole motif of the felling of trees in literature um, in the conversation after you finish, because there's plenty to say about that. There is, isn't there? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and there, I, I think it's another reason I love this poem, actually. I, I mean, trees are very iconic, aren't they, to us in film, in literature? Um, they, they seem to usually mean something so positive. Um, and I know a lot of people who have said they've found trees a great solace during these restrained times during lockdown. I know I have. I was, I haven't been able to see my family for a long time, my grandchildren and children. And I did, <laughs> this is a confession I would take to walking out into the park and giving a bit of a hug to the ash tree that's right in the middle of Victoria Park because the ash tree has survived a pandemic as well, actually. It felt like a bit of a comrade there. Um, so I think trees can definitely suggest solace. And I love the idea that trees can uh, sort of communicate under the earth, that there's a, a whole um, community of tree roots that's going on beneath the surface that we don't even see. There's so much to that. So we, we can come back to some tree poems, can't we? I thought I'd read, I realised that I have written quite a few poems about trees and it's nice because it's a different route through my poems to look at some tree ones. Um, but I thought I'd end up with a, a more um, contemporary one. So these poems are from my collection Naked Since Faversham from Pin Drop Press. Got, there are even some, some trees here. The Generosity of Woods. A hundred ways trees seek the sky, unlimited versions of vertical. They trellis the earth with dapple and dusk, 
Keep promising more bosky things I didn't know I'd need. Deer slot and scat, the dark, rin the dark tinged scent of rot, the blooms that come from it. Small cost, a trudge over skeleton leaves, while across the hillside, bracken flusters open frilled green wings. Look out for the clearing, where a lone anemone spills its blue. Soon there will be oceans. That I wrote that on a retreat, on an Arvon retreat, walking in the woods. When I'm in Italy, I live in Italy much of the time, though I've been rather caged here in London this year. I walk in the woods often and I kind of go there to get lost, really. Lizardry. Seduced by leaf light, I loop down and down into the woods, hoping to ambush whatever suns itself in secret. Moves like lightning before my ears understand it's gone. Come to a corner where path and thicket merge. That's when I see them. A shy trace of treasure in a pebbled bank, knitted green. Smallest suspicion of a tail, only ever visible by mistake. It always ends this way. Warm sandstone, nothing named. A twitched retreat and a tree that's down, a volume. Empty page where a tree once stood. If you pause, troubled by phantom branches, there's the shock of sunlight, earth and pallid growth, shaded for maybe 50 years, laid bare, a hollow, roots ripped from the soil where the trunk went over, everything before and after altered, storyline folded back on itself to spring a new chapter of homes, caves, gnawed crannies, annexes of woven twig, walkways tunnelled under the bark, and afterwards, a delicate dirt, not yet loam. The last tree one I'm going to read, uh, am I okay for time with this? To read a little bit more. Um, this is a sequence of three short poems and I wrote it during a residency in, um, in a London square where um, it was a rather beautiful garden square, not always open to the public. And there was not exactly an arboretum, but over the years people had brought very beautiful and some exotic-ish trees to this square. And I got friendly with the gardener there and started talking about where they'd all come from and what their names were and made friends with these trees in the square. Um, I've also taken inspiration from that and, and slightly naughtily from that quote from the gospel according to St Mark, I see men as trees walking. Actually, it's a, a story about um, uh, a man who couldn't see very well who's going to get a miracle done. <laughs> but I rather like the idea of seeing, seeing men as trees walking. Tree City, one. This young woman was a pretty prunus before she learned to walk. Her eyes, long-tailed passerines, fingers ringed with cherries. It's said she studied Mandarin, a spoken by the gossipy breeze in the ginkgo leaves. And from her neighbours, American Nyssa, Himalayan Rowan, silver-tongued eucalyptus, as many dialects as there are trees. Two. Ginkgo once grew tall, but now he's quiet, slow, likes to stand in the sun, Watch other trees pass by. No longer walks, not even in his sleep. Instead, he dreams of when his people came here long ago, coddled like royalty in their glass carriages below the decks of a tea trader's ship. 
On warm days, he remembers monsoon heat, cools his boughs with a hundred pale green fans. Three, Asa Cruzeum. When I was young, I kept no secrets, had no beliefs, clothed myself in bark that peeled each time the season turned. I changed my name, walked away from the garden, traveled over land, made friends with tumbleweed, drank too much summer dew, fetched up in a city square. I like this place, its trees, the people shallow rooted on its shore. I'll grow here in the way a maple grows, a sagrisaeum, paper bark, pinion, shedding layer after layer, always discovering another skin. Something so new and startled into leaf, something so green, the kindest breeze might bruise it. And um, if I've got time, I'll just read a poem that's, that comes back to here. Um, and it's another demolition. And it's what I've been watching out of my window over there. Um, it's what I can see from the, the study that I've sat in for many, many hours over the past year. Um, it, it's a Victorian terrace and our elderly neighbor died last year. And gradually the house has been taken and is being remade. Witness. They're pulling down the back addition of the house that was Stanley's, first with his mum and dad, then with the wife, and for the past 20 years, just Stanley. I can't stop gazing from my second floor study. This cleansing needs witness. No time to waste. They work all hours, race the weather. Through ripped out window holes, the whole place is alive with hectic light. Pickaxes wrench at timbers, yellow hard hats glow in the dark cave that was the outside privy, the room that housed the only tap in Stanley's home. The roof collapses as fast as a dried out tree. Hive's waistcoats swarm a ladder that extends and extends telescopically heads for the moon. Stanley's modest garden, its laissez-faire clematis and blow-in sycamore grove is becoming a tip. They carry out the perished goods he kept inside so long. Here they come with the thin sticks of his furniture. A roll of threadbare carpet unspools like a ton. Blistered layers of wallpaper printed with bows and blossom reeds fall open in the rain. Thank you, I can see that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Alex. I've been saying quite enough, I think. Would someone else like to come in? I'm sure that plenty want to say something from what I can tell from the comments that have been coming up. I was just gonna say, uh, yeah, Ben here, hi. Um, lovely readings and uh, there's so much I can see why you chose the Charlotte Mew poem at the beginning as a counterweight. There's so much um, build of emotion, and particularly the, the one that really struck me was a twisted retreat for the flicking of a of a lizard into the you know away from away from view. And there's kind of lots of the way you build to those moments in in three of the poems are just stunning. I think so. Um, and, and there's emotional intensity in all of them, particularly the last one. You know the sense of there's always something terrible about an empty house and uh, the legacy of somebody, particularly if it's been a couple of generations. Yeah. Uh, I thought that was well conveyed. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It has, I know it has to happen with the house <laughs> and I do understand that, but it is, it, it's quite odd to have watched this happening over weeks and months now to see sort of, I don't know, it is, it is like a, a kind of, the falling of a of a tree in a forest and something new coming back up out of it. It's been interesting. And, and, and also the way it a life, a private life becomes exposed when you know the the glimpses of the hard hats in the 
cave, you know, this, and all the sort of little, little moments of life just being taken away and just dumped and ceremoniously into the back of the garden. You know, we've all seen it, we've all experienced it, either with relatives or just witnessed it as you, you know, as with this poem. But, uh, and it's, it's and, it's, and it's not just individual, is it? It's a way of life that's leaving the East End very much. Mm. Um, you know, they're, they're going to put up a mansard roof and an open plan kitchen and it will be a very different life. And there, there really was just one tap in that house, which was mm. in the outside toilet. Yeah, but you, could, and you, but you also convey the warmth of the family in that community as well, which is which is being wiped away. And it, you're right, it is like the clearance of a wood. You know, it's it's a whole ecosystem that's disappearing. Yeah, very much enjoyed that uh, reading, Alex. Thank, thank you very much. It was, I, mean, I, I agree, trees are there was enormous solace, I think, particularly during this time. And I, I like your identification. It's almost as if you become a tree, almost. I think it's with a very, very close to you. I was interested um, in the idea that trees communicate, and there's quite a lot of discussion about that. That uh, there's a book called Entanglement. I don't know whether you've come across that yet about the, the way the sort of roots interrelate and, and talk to each other. I've seen also, it. Yeah, fungal spores and things in the ground can help the communication between trees. Mm. So yes, I mean the community of trees out there that we, we need to listen to and talk to. I think. Mm. Well, they're, they're, they're so important to us in so many ways, aren't they? They, you know, right. what we breathe out, they breathe in and vice versa. Absolutely. <laughs> we are reciprocal creatures, aren't we, really? Yeah. And they, they actually clean the air in a place like this. They are essential, actually, to help yeah. us survive Absolutely. all the poisons we pump out. And they do bring solace, they, because they move and they change, like in Charlotte Mew's lovely poem they have there's so much life in a tree good, good reading well done. thank you thank you thank you for reminding me about charlotte mew because i have really she wasn't on my radar at the moment but she's going to be tomorrow because one of my favorite poems of hers is the farmer's wife oh yeah um but uh, but your reading was fantastic thank you and i'm pleased that i've got someone new and female to go back to tomorrow Thank you, Wendy. I love The Farmer's Wife. It's such an interesting poem, isn't it? And I, I love the way she, I mean, her poems are pretty much usually elegiac or sad or mm. they're not about um, fulfillment in life, but there's a terrific sort of liveliness in yeah. them that actually yeah. balances against that, I, yeah. I think. Yeah, the musicality of the poems sort of raises them to another level above the solace that's in so many of them, I think. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Thank you. Thank you. Oops. I think we'll need to move on in a moment. Let me just, on that, on the last note that was being talked about there, um, I, I hear very often in Charlotte Mew a tendency to the, the down, the falling rhythms of the dactyl. And it was interesting to have her poem followed by your poems, Alex, because your ear is much more attuned to the, the central tradition in English language poetry, which is of course to rise to the upbeat mm. of, the, of the iamb. Mm. Um, but, but that poem of hers that you read had a very clear falling falling meter all the way through it. It's a free verse poem, but the tendency to fall is, is pronounced. And, and the dactyl is, is associated so much in antiquity with, with the elegiac mode. Everybody feels almost instinctively that that's where it belongs. And so I think that, that when we're reading Charlotte Mew, we're in a sense connecting with the real rootedness in the elegiac tradition. It's, it's there even in the, in the more upbeat of her poems. Mm. I think we'll move on, if we may. Thank you very, very much, Alex. And, yes. and now, finally, we come to Chris, Chris Woods. And I'm, I'm just because, because I happen to look for my copy, which uh, I'll just hold up. Here's, here's the one book of Chris's that I do have, Dangerous Driving, but there are more. Um, so Chris, without more ado from me, on to you and, uh, and your wonderful choice. 
Okay, th thanks, uh, thanks, Michael, and, and th thank you, Donald, for all you do for, for, for poetry and for the Hippocrates Prize. Um, and thanks, thank you for Alex, and, and thanks, Claudia, for two terrific readings. Uh, really enjoyed them. Thank you very much. Um, tonight, I, I want to uh, honour the memory of John Keats, who died 200 years ago. Uh, this very month, um, one of our very greatest poets. And um, uh, Keats is important to me, and I think he's probably important to lots of other poets. Uh, I mean, he probably single-handedly brought me to poetry. I was very much a scientist at school. Um, I didn't particularly like poetry very much. Uh, I remember studying Michael for, Wordsworth Michael for, for, for O-Level, uh, and found it completely boring. Um, that made virtually no impression. Uh, but my, my poetry appreciation changed uh, during my sixth form. And either because of perhaps a, a good general studies teacher or perhaps a hormonal influence, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. But um, I remember coming home one day, uh, one Saturday, I turned on the radio and um, somebody was reciting poetry. And I, once upon a time, would have just turned it off. But I, but I listened this time. And I, I was gobsmacked by what I heard. Um, this was somebody describing how I was feeling and, and, and how I was seeing the world at this time. And, and for a few moments, I, I, I sort of, I, I just lived inside those words. And I, it, was, it was an epiphany for me. Um, the poem was, it was Keats, and it was Ode to a Nightingale. And that, um, that sort of set me off. I went down to Bradford Library and took out, got out um, a biography on Keats and a copy of his poetry, read them straight through and started writing, started writing. And, um, uh, and I still am writing. And, and, and uh, so it's all Keats's fault, really. Um, the Keats was born 1795. He wrote his first poem when he was either 17 or 18, and he died when he was 25. Um, and if we think of all the wonderful poems he's written and marvelous letters uh, during that short space of time, it's absolutely astonishing what, uh, what he did. Um, Keats was also a medic, and quite a good medic by all accounts. Um, he enrolled at Bart's Hospital, uh, at Guy's Hospital, uh, when he was 19, but gave up medicine two years later to, to concentrate on poetry. Um, uh, the, po the poem I'm going to read in, in honor of Keats is on first looking into Chapman's Homer. And it was Keats's second published poem when he was 21. And it describes his, his own epiphany um, on reading Chapman's translation of Homer. Uh, Chapman was a Elizabethan dramatist and, and poet, and his translation was um, earthy and direct, and it, it appealed to, uh, to Keats as no other did, and was transformative for him. Um, it's a sonnet, and it's a, a poem of surprise, and full of surprising imagery. It has uh, astronomical illusions in it. Uh, it has historical illusions. The, the new planet that swims into his ken echoes the discovery of Uranus a few years before Keats was born. And Uranus was the, the first planet to be discovered since ancient times. So it's a big, it was a big number. And also Keats talks about, in the, in the poem, he talks about Cortez. Um, the Spanish conquistador who uh, was the first European to see the Pacific from the Americas. But Keats actually got it wrong. Uh, it was another Spanish conquistador called Balbeo who, who, who saw it. But that doesn't detract from the poem. Um, and it just shows that even the greatest poets can, can make mistakes. Um, I'd, just from the poem, before I read it, um, the, the, Darien is mentioned in the last line, and uh, Darien is a district of Panama. 
So, on first looking into Chapman's Homer by John Keats. Much have I traveled in the realms of gold and many goodly states and kingdoms seen. Round many western islands had I been where bards in fealty to Apollo hold. Oft of one wide expanse had I been told that deep browed Homer ruled as his demean. Yet never, yet did I never breathe its pure serene till I heard Chapman speak out loud and bold. Then felt I like some watcher of the skies when a new planet swims into his ken, or like stout Cortez when with eagle eyes he stared at the Pacific and all his men looked at each other with a wild surmise, silent upon a peak in Darien. Uh, it's difficult following Keats in a, in a poetry reading, but I'll, I'll have a go. Um, if we if we stay with uh, let's stay with some astronomical body. Um, a few years ago, um, Halley's comet made a return visit to planet Earth. It's been away for seventy five years, and um, it, I was determined to see it. It was going to be my last chance to see it. And each night, I'd, I'd walk up onto Holcomb Moor uh, near Ireland, you know, trying to spot it, trying to trying to find it. Um, and I didn't, um, and Halley's Comet did not swim into my ken, um, but I got a poem out of it. Um, the, uh, from the poem, the rod, rods and cones are the um, cells at the back of the eye, important for uh, colour vision and black and white vision. So, here we go. On not seeing Halley's Comet, the rods and cones of my retina scour the horizon like wire wool, but cannot penetrate the glow that stains the sky at its rim. I look in the west for a smudge of light that has traversed the constellations of the bull, the ram, and the rest of this old MacDonald's farm of the sky. On the moor, out in the middle of nowhere, I stand looking out into the middle of nowhere, and see nothing but the glory of the stars and the planets. You give me this, I am content. My orbit does not follow yours, but you move inside my skull. You are my interplanetary yo-yo. You are my celestial snooker ball, rebounding off the far cushion at the edge of the solar system. You are my cosmic boomerang. And in the year of your rebirth, I wish you many happy returns. Now Keats um, was a medic. I'm a medic. So I'm, I'm going to take you into, into coronary care. Uh, obviously metaphorically, not, not literally. And coronary care, there's echoes, we've seen echoes in intensive care, the intensive care units over this year. Um, it's often a place of high drama, but it, it's Coronary care has never been like the intensive care units we've seen on TV this year. Uh, in the poem, the U, U is the heart. Coronary care. Nurses thump my pillow, bring it back to life. Turn down sheets and pages of notes, murmur to themselves like the machines that graph my rise and fall in light. Rubber bracelets on wrist and ankle, a cuff by my arm that inflates. And you, my red balloon, lighter than life, ready to ascend so easily to heaven. My bruised red apple in a bony crate. You are more delicious than ever now. Sweetheart, you are always there. Such love I took for granted. Don't go. And I think over the course of the pandemic, lots of people have, have lost friends and, and loved ones. And I just remember how shocked I was when I, I lost my father suddenly many years ago now. And my memories of him were to do with the seasons, spring, 
summer, autumn and winter, the, the childhood memories. Seasons to my father. You throw green and light in one. Cut grass is fire in the evening sun. You wrestle me and grass clings. The light holds, a blackbird sings. Body surfing, waves climbing high, peaks melting into sky. Arms out in front, flurries of spray, avalanches of light carrying us away. Cricket, as the light goes, the sun behind you. With shadows reaching out, you touch the horizon, then dazzle me, bowling the sun. Frozen feet, fingers not there, snow and silence everywhere. You bring me back on my sled, then my fingers back from the dead. And staying with, with childhood, but in a, in a sorry, lighter note, this is, this is a poem about a, a day trip from uh, my primary school. It's my first uh, day trip from primary school. And we set off in this old bus uh, to Malham in the, in the Yorkshire Dales. And one of the spots, we, we, it's a beauty spot, we, we visited there called Janet's Foss, which is where a waterfall comes down into a, uh, a deep rock pool. Um, another thing from the poem, uh, a Kodak Brownie, okay, is a camera. And for those younger members of the audience, it was the go-to camera in the 50s and 60s. It was a very cheap plastic camera, but it worked very well. So here we go. Green. My Kodak camera didn't work but I have a picture of the green dress. The film was black and white. My memory is color. We'd eaten our lunch by 10 o'clock, sandwiches and crisps out of paper bags, a sickly smell inside the coach as we dizzied through the dales to Malham. My first day trip from Hanson Primary School into a countryside I didn't know. I don't remember who I sat next to, but it wasn't Wendy Smith in the green dress. Mr. Shepherd led us to Janet's Foss along a white stone path, the soft curves of the hills all around me and the blue sky and the dizziness still inside, down a rough track to a cool place full of ferns and moss and the sound of water. I didn't know what a waterfall was or how it could flow into cool, deep light. The stream slid over green, gushing down into a perfect pool. I surfaced to sunlight, a green dress, and you smiling at me. And for my last point this evening, staying sort of with the countryside, um, when I went to work, um, before going to work, I used to take our dog for a walk out in the morning and used to walk around the, the base of uh, Holcomb Hill, which is uh, just behind us. And for a few weeks, I noticed this, this older guy, this older bloke, just running up the front of Holcomb Hill and running down again. And uh, I was very impressed. I, I used to do a bit of running myself. I was very impressed. And um, he, he Wear, wear, always wear a pair of shorts, a t-shirt, sometimes a string vest, right? And it didn't matter whether it was raining or windy or it's cold, uh, he'd run up and down Holcomb Hill. Anyway, there was, I, I determined to have a word with him, so I, I, I waited at the bottom until he came down and I had a, had a talk to him. And um, firstly, first I was astonished he, uh, and he, he wasn't out of breath and quite irritating he wasn't out of breath you know whereas I would have been out of breath if I'd been doing what he was doing um, and um, I wrote him this poem um, and I gave it to him and it's a poem for him but also I think there's a bit of me in there as well racing time for Ron Heaton 
He elbows the cold morning aside, a string vest, 70 years, and legs bowed like the trees, but just as sturdy. Shorts billowing like the clouds, chin inclined to the hill. He will eat up the distance, have the hill for breakfast. The starting gun was a crack of knees first thing, then a stretch into the morning, a dawn chorus of approval everywhere. The breeze in the sails of his shorts as he battles up the waves of the hill, the effort breaking on his sheer face. He stumbles, but does not give way, fights back, tramples a hill underfoot, and the hill pushes back with strength. His arms pump, Pistons punch the air, pummel the morning, bare knuckles, knobbly knees in the groin of the hill. Because it is there, because he is there, because he will never hang up his heart, he plants the flag of himself on the top. Thank you, Chris. I'm sure. Dennis, Chris. Yes. I'm saying I enjoyed your reading, and particularly the running poem, because like you, I'm an ex-runner, and you really caught the, the pleasure and the physical feeling of running, too. So right. thank you. <laughs> I'd just like to thank you, Chris, for your coronary care, because I've used that poem a lot when I've taken workshops in schools with children, uh, teaching them or trying to teach them about how to care for your heart. Mm. I, I've never had your permission for using it. I'm just saying thank you now. <laughs> I got my, my full permission, Wendy. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, because they loved the sweet heart and the red balloon. Those were things that they could sort of hold on to and talk about. So well, thank you very much. <laughs> pleasure. I wanted to say I love that poem. And it's what stayed with me is the bruised red apple in a bony crate. Um, which is kind of, it's like the opposite of the bright ring around the bone in a way. It's the apple inside the bony crate. It's such a brilliant image. Um, inspired, really, I think. No, I, 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 I liked writing the poem. It's, uh, sometimes, sometimes they come with difficulty, but uh, no, I, I, I liked, I, I liked Corinne. It, it, it's, always, it's always difficult getting uh, poems together. I mean, particularly following Keats, actually. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky one, that. Um, but, um, you know, he, um, it's funny, I don't, I don't know whether other people have had that, whether they've had an epiphany or after reading or listening to somebody else's work. Um, and whether, whether particular poets have, have made them start writing. It'd be interesting to hear what, uh, what other people think about that. It was very, it was, it was it's very interesting getting, the reading together uh, and going back over Keats and realizing how how important a, a, a poet he'd been really and uh, just reading his, his work again and I think we should all try and read a Keats poem over this February to in, in, to honor his uh, to honor his memory really um, I, I I would imagine everyone has perhaps a, Keats, a favorite Keats poem if they haven't they could start reading him and find some I think it's always um, inspiring to go back to a poet who you haven't read for quite a while, actually, and, and re-find them. Yes. And think, oh, that's why, that's why I thought that was so marvellous. Um, and actually, there's more there to still be found. Yes, absolutely. Like Keats. I think my favourite is The Nightingale. Um, I would just like to say thank you for sharing, Chris. Um, your anecdotes and your poetry. And I really agree that poems can really change your life. Um, as you mentioned, um, reading John, John Keats in school, um, for me, it was Sylvia Plath, um, which I won't talk about her poetry, um, but I think, yeah, yes, I really agree with your point. So thank you for sharing. But there's a wonderful poem by Peter Porter, the late Australian writer who lived in London, uh, which is on looking into Chapman's Hesiod. As Chapman 
Chapman translated a, a large number of, of Greek and Latin poets. Um, Peter referred to him as the Elizabethan perpetual motion machine in that poem because he was, I think I'm right in saying, the most prolific writer of the Elizabethan age. Um, but it's a glorious poem itself. I mean, a lot of these poems that live in the overcoat of Keats's famous sonnet are almost have almost become more interesting than the thing that inspired them. Um, I mean, it's it's it. What Peter Porter does is to use Chapman's translation of Hesiod as a tool for understanding the nature of modern Australia, and. Um, it's, it's a poem that's full of jokes. I mean, to, to teach your grandmother to suck eggs is a textbook possibility in New South Wales, lines like that. Um, but it's also full of analysis of what the actual social conditions of, of Australia are and, and how that compares with the standoff between um, Boethia and, uh, and Athens in Greece. It's a glorious poem, right. um, and I think I think also of another poem by an Australian who I'm happy to say is still alive. He'll be 75 this month. That's Robert Gray. Um, his poem "Home Run," which is about the train ride back to where he lives along the coast, is all about the point on the New South Wales coastline on that train journey when one can first see the Pacific Ocean. And of course, inevitably, he's then thinking of, of that moment in Keats's sonnet, but of course, from the opposite end of the, <laughs> of the Pacific. Uh, and, and the word Darien gets into that poem, needless to say. Um, there's such a long trail that has come out of that one sonnet of Keats's that it's almost as long by now as, as the trail of, of um, poems and imitations that have come out of Homer himself. Well, I think everybody um, looks as if they need their Ovaltines or Horlickses. Um, <laughs> thank you for having the charity to smile at that limp joke. Um, before we close down, let me just do a little bit of advertising. Um, the first advertisement, of course, is for the next one of this series. In March, we'll be very happy to have Tony Daniels or Theodore Dalrymple, as he is known by his nom de plume, talking about medical poets, doctor poets, and so on. Um, he wrote a whole book of mini essays on this subject, which um, interestingly enough was published by the illustrious Hippocrates Press. Um, so for those of you who haven't read or acquired the book, Tony's um, talk about doctor poets and their writings will be a tremendous way of acquiring the taste and deciding whether or not to give it to somebody as a birthday present um, and so on. But seriously, it, he's, he's a wonderfully entertaining speaker and, and writer. So please make a note of that. Uh, the details are on the website as always. Um, the other thing I should remind you of, of course, is that the deadline for this year's Hippocrates Prize has not yet passed. It's the middle of this month, I think the 15th. So um, you have a day or so still to send in your Keatsian sonnets, or I suppose given what Keats was doing, your Italian sonnets, um, and, or any other sonnets you choose to write, your Paul Muldoonish sonnets, or your E.E. E. Cummings sonnets, or anything else. Or if you have any other complaints, you should see your doctor. I think those are the two important announcements, the impending deadline of the competition and the reunion with the wonderful Tony Daniels or Theodore Dalrymple next session that we have. A wonderful evening. Thank you. 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 Thank you.